So I'm delighted that today we're going to hear from speakers from right across the world. And this is why we've chosen this uh, time for the seminars this particular month, because we have guests right from one side of the world in Canada and also from Nepal, um, and as well as in Denmark. And we're going to ask them to talk to us about their experiences and their knowledge and their um, understanding of different ways that we can work to address the issues that I've just spoken about, and particularly in relation to uh, right to education, but also in ch ensuring children have a family life that are laid out in the resolution. Just to go quickly through the timetable today, we're going to hear, we're going to have four presentations. Um, in between those, we're going to have an opportunity for you to go into breakout rooms and to discuss a question we're going to ask you to talk about in a, in a group regarding um, the practices in your country and education alternative care and its relationship. And then at the end of this um, seminar, we have allowed um, a good amount of time for you to be able to ask questions and to raise or discuss any of the issues you've heard in the seminar today. So if you do have questions, if you could kindly either put them in the chat box or save them until we come to the end of the seminar when we will do our best to answer them. So I'm now going to turn to our first speaker. This is Dr. Marilyn Hoare. Um, I have to uh, hold up my hand and say, I know Marilyn very, very, very well. Marilyn was a colleague of mine when we both worked for UNICEF. I was, um, I was chief of uh, child protection and Marilyn was chief of education for UNICEF. And it was a delight to be able to have a UNICEF colleague from a different topic who really understood child protection as well and, and was, we were able to work closely together. So Marilyn is sitting in Canada, so it's very, very early in the morning for her. And I don't know if she's had her pancakes for breakfast because she does make very good pancakes. And Canada before receiving her master's in educational leadership and a PhD in educational studies. She then worked with school improvement projects in Qatar and the United Arab Emirates before joining UNICEF. And as I mentioned, Marilyn was the Chief of Education for UNICEF in Uzbekistan in 2010. She then moved to become the UNICEF Chief of Education in Nepal in 2014. And her last posting, her most recent posting, was as the UNICEF Chief of Child Protection in Kenya. In all the three UNICEF offices, Marilyn worked closely with child protection colleagues, and as I said, I can vouch for that to ensure that the education systems were focused on the rights and best interests of the child. And initiatives um, that she worked on included deinstitutionalization, reducing gender-based violence, addressing child marriage, and eliminating child labor. And I'm now going to pass the floor to Marilyn. And welcome, Marilyn, and thank you so much for getting up so early and being with us. <laughs> Thanks, Chrissy. Well, you know, I'm pretty much a morning person anyway, so that's fine. And uh, I have to say that um, working with Chrissy, I got a good introduction to child protection. As an educator, I wasn't always aware of all of the things that were uh, necessary to think about of child protection. So she uh, gave me a good education in that area. And I'm also really pleased to see all of the uh, participants from Nepal. Um, I recognize many of the organization names. I don't know if there's anybody that I have met personally, but uh, give me a little uh, heads up in the comments if, if you do. Um, so one of the things, and it's something that Chrissy and I talked a lot and struggled a lot with when we were together in Uzbekistan, but was also an issue when I was in Nepal and also in Kenya is, can children be provided a good education, but also be provided their right to be with their family? To the next slide. Um, as educators, and I'm sure most of you are aware of these as well, that um, the child development involves a number of skill areas. It's not just the cognitive development, and uh, so it's family and community, they're really important. 
as well as the education system to provide the full range of development for children. And that's gross motor skills. Of course, as a child grows up, they develop those skills. The fine motor skills and in education, we're often thinking about you know, holding the pencil, being able to write as, um, computer skills, speech and language development, obviously, cognitive, cognitive development. So that's the area that schools usually take a responsibility for. But we know that children's social and emotional development are just as important. And I have to say that generally governments, ministries of education, they recognize their responsibility in all of these areas for a child's full development. So they don't just take on the cognitive development role, but they look at everything. And also most ministries of education therefore recognize the importance of family and community. And that's why you'll see, you know, PTAs, parent teacher associations, community boards, community events involving parents and community in the school system. Next slide. But sometimes it's very difficult to access schools. And this is a picture from Nepal, as <laughs> many of you probably guessed. And you can see those little blue dots are children leaving the school and finding their way home. So if you can imagine doing this twice a day up and down that hill. And so, um, you know, there are difficulties for children getting to school. The distance to school, the geographical terrain, uh, pastoralist families that are on the move with their livestock. There also lack of teachers, especially specialists. And so not just, um, you know, uh, somebody that can teach sign language or uh, braille, but also as the children get older, looking at subject specialists that aren't available everywhere. So communities, education systems often look at boarding schools as being the solution to this. Boarding schools effectively institutionalize children, taking over the role of parents and community. And I think this is one, um, and I hope it comes up in some of the discussions, you know, are children in boarding schools institutionalized? Do we think of them in that way? But there are other solutions. And I think of uh, an instance in Nepal where I, I think uh, I saw in the slide that Humla is going to be highlighted. And I think it's that area where families um, at one part of the year would um, just pick up and move because they would go south to trade salt. And so I actually, and when I was with UNICEF was requested to help set up a boarding school. So because, you know, the school would close when the whole families, the whole community would be shut down and kids wouldn't be in school. The thing is that if children aren't going with their family to that really important event, think of everything they're missing out on. They're missing out learning about their family's trade, learning about that salt trading business. We know that those kinds of um, events, I have to say, they often involve, you know, ritual events, community events, meeting family and other important people. And so taking that away from children just to keep them in school for their cognitive development can really be at a detriment to their social and emotional development. So it was interesting. One, I did, couldn't find a picture of it, but one of the communities had actually built a school in the south. And so most of the year that building was empty, but when the whole community moved south, the teacher came with and set up the school in the area where the families were encamped. Um, pastoralist communities, um, UNICEF has supported a number of ministries of education and communities looking at mobile schools. I think that now <laughs> one thing COVID has given us is lots of experience and information on distance learning and there's examples all over the world of providing schooling through distance learning. 
um, and especially specialist teachers so that they we can connect in specialists to communities. There might be a um, teacher there that doesn't have the specialist training, but they can be with the community and with the students to help them and then use distance learning to bring in the specialization and the subject specialists. Next slide. But boarding schools are a reality. And uh, often I found the boarding schools were actually set up for the effectiveness or the efficiency of the system and the ease of the educators and medical specialists, I have to say, rather than what are the rights of the children. So for example, um, in, in Uzbekistan, there was a great kindergarten. So think kindergarten age. Um, and it was fabulous what they were providing the children, but the children with special needs were not able to go home, either mobility problems. Um, and so they just set up a place for the children to sleep and they would, those little children would not see their family and often for weeks because it was too difficult. The reason it was told to me, oh, well, when the doctor comes, he likes to come to just one place and see all the kids in one place instead of having to go around to all the different communities. So this was set up for the ease of the system rather than the rights of the children. And also we find that children with those long separations for family can really be distanced, not just physically, but emotionally from their family. And also just the skills to be part of a family and a community. So a deaf school that I visited, again, a really well-equipped school, really wonderful teachers providing great resources for those children and learning experiences. But those children, especially as they got older, they just quit going home, even during school breaks. Because when they did get home, they couldn't communicate with their family. There was nobody, they had no friends in the community. There was nothing for them in the community. And what we also found then as children graduated, then there was no reason for them to go back to their community. And essentially then they usually would stay in whatever large urban center they had been schooling in and look for something. Um, in addition, I've, <laughs> Chrissy and, and I found an interesting situation in Uzbekistan where um, we went to a school that was a special needs school. And as I was sitting there with my national officer and we looked at each other and it was um, an organized event with Special Olympics to bring kids with special needs with other children. We said, boy, you can't even tell which kids are the special needs kids. This is wonderful. And then we met with these kids and discovered that really they had learning disabilities. That was it. And, and so really highly functioning children in a special needs school, but it was easier for the teachers rather than trying to address the needs of a child who was having difficulty reading um, with mathematics, they put them all together in a boarding school. So that's something we'd rather not see, of course. The next slide. Next slide. So it's really important that we involve parents in communities. Parents often think that boarding schools provide a better education, but that's often only looking at the cognitive development and the academic skills. So we need to look at the whole development of the child. Next slide. Now, if you look closely at this picture, I hope you can see it. The building in the front is a girls boarding school. Looks nice, you know, it was a good facility. If you look in the background, you can see just on the other side of the field, there's some buildings. And this is a refugee camp in Kenya. And the parents in that refugee camp were sending their girls to this boarding school because they felt that that's where um, their girls would have a protected environment. And I mean, we know that the incidents in, of abuse in institutions and in boarding schools can be very high. 
but parents thought that this would remove their girls from the gender-based violence in the community and protect them, especially from early pregnancies. Now, the thing was, the, when the school was out for school break, of course, the children were back in the family and the community. And what I was hearing is a number of them were getting pregnant during those school breaks. So by removing children from family and community, we don't give them the skills to deal with the issues and helping the community and families address the issues, especially that girls are having to deal with. So we have to remember the education system itself, a school building itself cannot provide protection to children. It's the people around the child that does. Next slide. Now this was a, another instance, and this is an example from Nepal. This was a program by UNICEF, uh, Ministry of Education and World Education to work with communities to identify girls who had dropped out of school. Now, rather than putting them in a boarding school, <laughs> they, we worked really hard in this community um, to try to get these girls back to school. And in this case, we discovered why we, we met with the, the parents and the girls is that the cast, the girls from this cast were bullied as they walked to school. It wasn't that great a distance, but they had to walk through another village. And they were bullied so much on the way to school that they would prefer to drop out of school than to get to school. So by working, by keeping those girls in the community and working with families and community, then we could also work with the men and the boys. And they became a part of the solution rather than separating the girls from the community. Next slide. Now I was really pleased in the three uh, countries that I worked in that the ministry personnel were very aware of international best practice. And, but they were struggling on how to provide quality education while also meeting parents' demands and expectations. Um, and, and so they, they were struggling to try to find solutions, trying to keep children in their communities and with their families, but also providing every child, even children with special needs with the best education possible. Next slide. So some of the things that they, they learned as, um, as they struggled with this. It's really important. Most um, ministries I found had really good inclusive education policies, but were really struggling on how to implement them effectively. Uh, budgets were really important, especially for things like transportation and school meals were very important. And we can talk more about that if you're interested. Looking at how to provide quality education throughout the country not just in the large urban centers. As I mentioned, PTA, school communities, getting community involved, parents involved were really important. A lot more use of distance learning. And then a lot of support to parents to, to because there's lots of studies there about the cost to parents. Not, certainly there's the cost of sending their children to boarding school, but there are costs to having their children at home as well. And so these were some of the areas that we really had to struggle with. Um, and the next, I think this is the last slide. I wanted to mention here, oh no, there's one more slide because I think I've got listed all the <laughs> different people to take into consideration. So um, is with UNICEF, we worked a lot with policymakers, but it's bringing in all the other stakeholders to develop good policy and also implement the policy. And I wanna highlight here, Ministry of Finance and how important that is. And I wanna mention in Uzbekistan, and this is the group that met in Uzbekistan and really had a good understanding of how they'd been left with a very highly institutionalized system from the Soviet era, and they were still trying to you know, move forward from that. 
So they wanted to deinstitutionalize children. And so they had decided they were gonna try to close 10% of their special schools every year. They had a lot of them. <laughs> and so <clears throat> then they had to work with Ministry of Finance to, for their whole education budget. Ministry of Finance normally just increased every line item by 5%. That was just how they did it. So when I met with them, I said, whoa, but you know, so he had increased the number of special schools, you know, three more special schools. I said, no, no, no. What the policy is now is to reduce the number of special schools. Oh, okay. So he slashed the budget by 10%. Whoa, <laughs> that doesn't mean these children go away and we still need a budget to, to help them and help their families and help their communities and provide the support they need. So, you know, Ministry of uh, Finance has huge uh, control over some of these budgets, and we really need to find ways of working with them. So that, thank you very much. I look forward to our discussions today. Thank you so much, Marilyn. And I think you took us through a real whistle-stop tour of parts of the different parts of the world, but also gave us a really good understanding of, of policy. Uh, frameworks, but also it, the practical um, implications of that as well. And, and I think one thing um, that you said that I'd like to just pick up on as well before we move to our next speaker, because I think it's, it's going to be very relevant, very relevant, is the fact that, um, and we can see from your photographs, it's a, it, that it's working with national governments on their policies, their aspirations. So although across the world we share international treaties such as the UN resolution we're talking about today, which has been, uh, which have been developed with lots of input from countries around the world, um, but as you and I know, it's about help, uh, it's about understanding what is learned practice and in, in international shared wishes and desires for the best interest of children, but also it's about supporting national governments with their own aspirations, their policies, they're the ones that develop it, those, the, those are the people working at community level as well, um, so that it's not about just imposing policy or in, imposing international treaties. It's actually, um, I think as you've also touched on and explained, it, it's about, um, you know, particularly in, in the case of UNICEF, being there to support what governments themselves want to do. And I think that's a really important aspect. Um, I now have the great pleasure of introducing Mr. Chitap Lama, who is the director of an organization called Himalayan Education and Development, known as HEAD in Nepal. And also Mr. Ujwal Amatia, who is the country director of Mission East, and he's also in Nepal. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Ujwal to introduce himself when he starts to speak, because I'm afraid I don't have any background information um, to introduce him with. But Mr. Lama um, is the founding direct executive director of HEAD, the Himalayan Education Development um, Organization in Nepal. He has a master's degree in English and a BA in English and Sociology. And he also has an extensive professional background in the development sector and the management of civil society organizations. He's a community leader as well, working for the overall development and empowerment of people with disabilities and other marginalized communities. Mr. Lama has expertise in project development on specialized and inclusive education, gender equity, social education, and social inclusion, including inclusion of those with disabilities. As the executive director of HEAD, Mr. Lama spearheads all aspects of the organization's work. He also serves as a global civil society leader through many other national and international initiatives and sits on committees. And his vision is to see an inclusive society where marginalized communities around the world, including people with disabilities, are empowered and are living with dignified lives. And I know um, that we're going to have an extremely interesting presentation on some very practical aspects around the inclusion of children with disabilities in their local um, education system. And so with no ado, I'm now going to hand over to um, Ujwal and also to Mr. Lama. And if Mr. Lama, if you'd like to share your screen, I believe you're going to show your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chrissy, for this opportunity. So it's a good, good pleasure 
to have this in this, in this seminar. So uh, my name is Ujala Mate. I'm working as a candidate director for Missions Nepal uh, last three years. Uh, uh, Missions in, in Nepal is working since 2007. So we work in development and emerging sectors. So in development, like we are more focused on disability inclusion, uh, climate change, uh, livelihood, and food security. Was uh, so uh, we work with our local partners. Local partners. We have three local partners right now. So one of them is Head Nepal. So we work through with Head Nepal, especially on disability inclusion, and and Head Nepal is also working with children with disabilities, CWC, children with disabilities. So uh, Chitu will share more uh, about the work that we are doing in and Humla, especially with the uh, children with disabilities. So Chituji, is over to you, Chituji. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chrissy. Uh, and uh, thank you, Ujolji. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss about some practical uh, approach and uh, aspect how we can best uh, integrate children with disabilities into mainstream education through an uh, inclusive interventions that we do in the Himalayas uh, region of Nepal. So let me now welcome you, all of you to the Himalayas of Nepal, where it's now snowing uh, outside and uh, uh, it's very beautiful. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, you yes. Uh, just give me an uh, give me a minute. Sorry, I'm having some issue with my screen reader. Uh, and uh, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm visually impaired uh, also. I'm using my screen reader software on my computer, so you might have to adjust uh, with some technical issues. Sorry. Just, uh, We can't see your screen now. Amelio, Mirio, only Rasa, and as a listener. Oh, cool over the manager. If you want, we can present from our side if that's easier for you. He has a screen tracker. We have, so. we have your presentation, so we can share the screen from our side. Uh, now, now, can you see my screen? No, 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 JWZ. Still not. Only your desktop. Yeah. Only your desktop. Let me just restart the presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, now, now it's coming. Can you make a little bit loud? but it's Oh, no, I think it's easy. Okay. It's now fine. Thank you. Sorry for this technical issue. Uh, so let me welcome you all to the Himalayas of Nepal, where I am. This is Humla district, uh, the one of the most remote and mountainous district of Nepal, where we uh, are working. Uh, I work as a, a founding executive director of Himalayan Education and Head Nepal. Uh, so Head Nepal in general works for overall development and empowerment of people with disabilities in, uh, and uh, specifically for uh, empowering and in, uh, inclusion of children with disabilities in particular. So uh, in, in this presentation, I'm going to discuss about how we are doing um, this uh, inclusive uh, education practice in, 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 in this Himalayan district. So before I uh, go, how we do, uh, the, uh, do our interventions on inclusive education, uh, these are some barriers, you know, there is the human rights uh, watch reports estimate that uh, there are about 207,000 uh, children with disabilities one third of them never go to school. Uh, only 380 uh, out of 30,000 uh, schools, uh, you know, provide specialized uh, education for children with 
affected. And in a uh, mountain region of Nepal, 90% of children, they are illiterate. So likewise, uh, most of the uh, mainstream edu uh, schools, um, uh, just few of the mainstream uh, schools accommodate the needs of uh, children with special needs. And the specific disability like blind, uh, children with uh, blindness and uh, uh, mentally disabled, they are just grouped and linked with uh, the similar, you know, other kinds of uh, children. And the children with disabilities in the Himalayan, Himalayan region, you know, they face a lot of barriers and uh, problems in accessing accessible quality and uh, equitable education as well as in, in education. So, with this uh, instance, you know, uh, I, I remember uh, Mar Marilyn, she has shared so many of her experiences uh, in Nepal, working in Nepal, you know, the, the terrain. Uh, one of the um, challenges she shared was the uh, tough uh, geographical condition. And this is Tehe village, one of the remote village in uh, Humla district. And uh, uh, the, 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 the picture you can see on the right side, that, that's the boy, 14 years boy, Gora Singh. He never been to school before when he was uh, already 14, you know. And he was outcast, he was bullied and discriminated, not only, you know, by the villagers and community people, but also by his own family uh, members. Uh, this is just an example, you know, of the... Uh, the situation of uh, children with disabilities in the uh, in in the park. and to make sure the children like Gorasing and others to 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 have a chance of fair living and life, you, we head Nepal ensure the inclusive education through uh, measure three steps. The first steps, uh, first step that we do is the mobile school and outreach program for children with disabilities. And the second step is the uh, community-based resource center for those children who need extensive support and specialized learning method. And of course, the third step that we uh, do is integrating those children with disabilities into mainstream uh, community schools. So let me discuss, let me show you how we do these three steps in, in, in practice. So as already I mentioned, the first step is to uh, the, the mobile school. So mobile school, how we, why we started mobile school is, you know, if the child cannot go to school with any region, we think that the school must go to the child. That's why in this remote mountain region in Humla, you know, we, we started mobile school. The mobile school is the first step to bring literacy and education and other kinds of trainings to the children with disabilities and their parents in the remote mountain district. And uh, so, yeah. so this began in 2011 when the, uh, the organization was uh, founded. And here, how we do is uh, Humla, there is no road network. And so we don't have any you know, uh, means of transportation. So we use horses to travel to the, uh, the, the, the community and the, the teachers, they are traveling to the um, uh, remote mountain villages on horseback and identify, locate and identify, identify children with disabilities in the community. And we assess their needs and provide basic life skills and uh, Orientation and mobility skills, basic literacy, uh, literacy for uh, children with disabilities, for instance, a basic uh, braille concept for children with visual impairment, and uh, the concept of sign language for children with deaf and hard of hearing, you know. So, and uh, of course, the confident building trainings. And the most important part is the parental education uh, for the family member and parents, because in the remote mountain districts, the parents of uh, the family members has very limited, uh, you know, understanding how, uh, about the disability. So they have to learn how to manage 
uh, the disability that their child has, and also to understand their potentiality, potentiality so they can support for their uh, education. So ultimately, the mobile school opens the gateway to the formal education once we have completed this, uh, the, the above you know, mentioned uh, trainings and uh, courses. So these are the uh, some photos how we conducted uh, how we conduct mobile school. So you see, we don't have specific you know classroom and uh, buildings or school or infrastructure. So we have to conduct our classes on rooftop, sometimes under a tree, sometimes uh, on the grasses, grassland, you know. And so uh, uh, we provide these, these trainings. These are the some examples. Learning braille, mobility skills, all those through this through the mobile school. Of course, then once we completed the mobile school uh, trainings for children and both the children and the parents, we uh, most of the children they are identified through mobile school are integrated in the uh, regular uh, community school, but still some uh, some children those they have severe disability and require extensive, extensive you know, learning in uh, support and specialized method are, are you know, enrolled in the community-based resource center uh, that, we are, that we started in Simico, uh, some uh, centers of the, 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 the local government. And uh, so here in this center, what we, provide uh, trainings are, you know. So these are the activities included in the resource center as, uh, as for the needs of uh, the children with special. So we provide uh, an, an enabling, you know, environment to, uh, for their uh, overall growth and uh, education development as well. So we provide Braille literacy in different languages, that means in English and Nepali for children with children. And we provide orientation and mobility skills for their easy and comfortable mobility in the tough terrain like Humla. So like otherwise, daily living skills and uh, you know, uh, personal care. And we, as well as we provide computer uh, skills for children. Uh, and also included the special accommodation like uh, screen reader software while providing training on. Uh, so we also provide basic healthcare uh, services for children who are in need, especially those children who have physical disabilities. They require uh, uh, physiotherapy and other interventions to improve their disability and support for their education. As well as we provide specialized, you know, uh, metrics, uh, assistive devices for children with disabilities. Uh, the services at the community center also uh, includes the accessible, uh, accessible uh, games, sport, and uh, extracurricular activities. And while participating, uh, the children in these all activities, we make sure that um, they are well connected and. Uh, uh, connected to their parents and family because the center are best in the community itself, but because of the, the <clears throat> lack of uh, you know a specialized service in regular uh, community schools, we we are doing this. So these are uh, some uh, uh, photographs of how we uh, you know uh, provide uh, these facilities to the community uh, resource center. So we provide gardening training, mobility training, computer uh, training through CCTV, the, the magnifying, you know, screen, uh, bell learning, etc. So these are the some uh, glimpses of uh, the accessible, you know, sports like uh, you know, blind child can play chess, and a uh, blind guy that I was uh, that I introduced, Gorasing, he's drawing you know though he's totally blind he's drawing so uh, these are the extracurricular activities at the center that we provide for these kids 
So of course, after uh, identifying them into mobile school and providing basic training, then getting them into the, uh, the, the community-based resource center, we now successfully integrate the children with disabilities into mainstream regular community school. So this is the third stage of our, uh, our uh, initiatives for inclusive education. So in this stage, children are uh, 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 enrolled at the community school, but they still do uh, have their uh, special need. So we support them with, uh, you know, we collaborate, we collaborate those children, uh, the, the community school, and we provide extra classes on uh, math, science, and uh, English. Those are harder subject, subject and uh, mm, we provide homework support uh, classes and extracurricular activities at the school and the center itself. And admission and registration support. We provide teacher training on inclusive education. We also try to you know, modify and uh, make the, the school environment, the physical environment accessible for children with disabilities as well. So these are the pictures, you know, how they, uh, on the, our children with disabilities, they are uh, integrated into school and uh, beyond. Yeah, you can see uh, the grossing, he's attending the, the regular uh, school class and they are studying uh, the partially sighted girl, Lakshmi, she's interviewed in a uh, local FM radio and learning computers, et cetera. So these are a uh, few additional steps that we uh, take in the community uh, school. We provide school training, uh, teacher training on education and innovative resources for inclusive education. Likewise, we built a RAM uh, in uh, community schools so children can better access to the classroom. Uh, yeah. So these are the some successful, uh, you know, example uh, stories of a child. The child was identified at the age of fourteen. He is um, now graduated and now uh, pursuing his uh, higher education in uh, in, in Kathmandu, uh, Gorasin. And the Lalita, she is partially sighted, doing her bachelor degree in uh, Kathmandu, uh, the Pasupati Multiple Campus in Kathmandu. So like these two children, there are lots of other graduates as well doing their best in the uh, study. And also some are teaching in community school as well. So we think we have to do still more. And like these four kids, uh, uh, Narendra, uh, Pandevi, uh, Savita and Sarah, there are other thousands of uh, children with disabilities waiting for a better, better future and waiting for a service like this three steps uh, approach. And uh, we think, you know, since these three uh, uh, steps of, uh, you know, uh, inclusive education uh, works in this Himalayan region of Nepal, we, we are sure that it can also be work in overall Nepal and beyond. But for this, we need, uh, you know, resources and support from, uh, uh, from yeah, like-minded uh, organizations, government itself, and other individuals. So let me uh, conclude my um, presentation, sending you uh, greetings from this beautiful uh, three kids, Sonia, Rambadur, and uh, uh, yeah, Lal Lalsara. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, if you have any questions or uh, any uh, uh, comments, I welcome, thank you. I have great delight in introducing um, two colleagues. It's Katja Gunstoff Borschen. I don't know if I pronounced that right, sorry, Katya. Uh, Katya is the Programme Coordinator for International Aid Services, AIS, in Denmark. She holds a Master of Science in Public Administration, with a, had a main focus on developing countries and in international relations. 
IAS is a faith-based organization, mainly working in the Horn of Africa and Sahel, and works both humanitarian and development sector. Since it was founded 20 years ago, the organization has worked with children with special needs and their right to inclusion in society and their right to inclusion in education. Kat is responsible for IAS's inclusive education program in Sudan, Tanzania, Kenya, and South Sudan. And she's also been employed by the Ministry of Higher Education and Science in Denmark as a special advisor. With her is Mr. Stephen Mawara. He is the lead program manager at IAS Denmark and is also the chairperson of the Regional Coordinating Committee based in Nairobi, Kenya. Before joining IAS, Stephen was working with the Government of Kenya as a lecturer in the Kenya Institute for Special Needs, and he also holds a Master of Philosophy in Special Needs Education. Working with the Regional Coordinating Committee, um, the committee has a leading role for IAS's inclusive education program that's now happening in Sudan, Tanzania, Kenya, and South Sudan. And I'm delighted to hand over the floor to you both. Um, and we're very interested to listen to your presentation. And August, um, if I can't see you, but yeah, lovely. You're going to share your screen. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Kriti, for this fine presentation. I believe you can hear me out there. Yes. Uh, so my name is Katja gonatov uh, Bison, and I'm the program manager of IS uh, or coordinator of IS Denmark. Uh, I'm here to take today together with my colleague Stephen, that is based in Nairobi. We will both be speaking. I will be introducing and he will be giving you some substance and then I'll be closing. Uh, we are, are coming both from IS uh, Denmark and um, we are a member of Center of Church-Based Development, CKU, um, as a faith-based organization. We are a small NGO in Denmark um, and we've existed for around uh, 20 years. Um, we have given the title today of our presentation, um, our journey from local to national level inclusive education, because that is what we have been working with for, yeah, since the establishment of IS for 20 years. I think you can switch, shift the presentation to the slide. Yeah, so a few um, minutes about IS. Um, Actually, IS was founded uh, by our yeah, di director, uh, current director, 20 years ago. Um, he was with a team in Somaliland, and um, and actually, at the area he was in, he was. Um, they were saying government people, people working in schools, saying actually we have don't, we don't have children with disabilities in our countries. It doesn't exist. And he was like, no, um, we don't actually, not sure that you are really, uh, what you're saying is true. So they took a day, uh, IS team, that team that were at that time, 20 years ago, to say, okay, the villages we are around now, we'll go a day and look and see if we can find any children with disabilities. So they, the team of IS took a day in the villages and they identified 500 children within the villages they could reach. So these were children that were bound. These children were hidden. Uh, not bound because um, um, the parents didn't like them, but because to keep them keep them sa safe, but also to because of all the prejudice that are the shame that was connected to the children with disabilities. So this uh, is a story of IS. It was uh, is an um, experience that struck uh, the founder of IS Denmark. So the work with children with disabilities have been um, been with IS for 20 years and is, is like consists, I would say, of 20% of the organization work is, is about inclusive education. And um, yeah, so that is what has shaped um, IS. Um, we also work with the uh, humanitarian aid, uh, as you can see, and we are often, we find ourselves in countries that are, yeah, unstable too, as we work both uh, with Sudan and also South Sudan in the inclusive education program. Uh, IS as an organization, uh, not only in four countries, uh, these with um, working with inclusive education, but we work with uh, around nine, 10 countries. IS Denmark is also a part of uh, an alliance with a small entity of IS in Germany and IS in the United States, uh, both small organizations. We also close connected to uh, Sweden, uh, where we formerly a few years ago had an IS Sweden that was merged with Lekamissionen that is also uh, listed at this presentation now. 
So, so this is also a close partner to IS Denmark. Yeah, uh, I think you can shift. Yeah, so what we will share today is our experience with inclusive education for, for many years, but mostly looking back at three phases uh, program. Uh, first phase going from 16 to 18, uh, and the second phase uh, we just closed here by the end of uh, 21, and now entering a, a last phase. So it's a 10 year program in four countries where we have worked uh, for many years locally, but now the, this uh, final phase, or not final, but in this financially final phase, uh, we are going to or trying to, to reach national level. We have done some attempts and we have successes and failures, but um, this is the, the journey we'll try to, to show you on a more general level. So, um, yeah, I think I will hand over now to my colleague Stephen Mora that will share with you about. Um, how do we work with inclusive education? What are the main barriers and areas of intervention? But also what are the change agents we have uh, seen in, in the years we have been working with inclusive education? So welcome, Stephen. Yeah, thank you very much, Katja, for that uh, overview of the journey from Somalia in 1999 up to now. It has been uh, a challenging but interesting journey to reach where we are today. Maybe let me start by saying that uh, our desired uh, objective of the inclusive education program is to see children who are facing barriers to learning in the four countries of Kenya, Sudan, Tanzania, and South Sudan, enjoying recognition and inclusion in social structures and also have sustainable education opportunities that positively affect their life through uh, removing of barriers, learning barriers. Uh, our target group is children facing barriers to learning. Specifically, we have those with disabilities and other learning needs and the girl child. That was our target groups. And the IAS follows human rights based approach. Maybe you can go to the, the other slide. Next slide, please. The IS follows a human rights-based approach to inclusive education. And that requires uh, a clear understanding that inclusion is an approach to education for all children, regardless of whether they have disability or not, which is based on the provision of a convention of the rights of the child, and regardless of the barriers, whether it's physical or in kind or otherwise. And to achieve this, uh, we need to create systems and schools which respond to the needs of individual children. Because all children are learning at different paces, and therefore we need a system. We need uh, schools that uh, can be able to respond to the needs of these children, rather than probably forcing children who have different learning needs uh, to comply with the rigid, sometimes predetermined uh, secretary settings like the special schools. We need the children to be educated close to their homes, neighboring schools, so that the parents can also take their roles of looking at, the, at their children when they are being educated. And in our program for ownership and sustainability, we target working with the local civil society groups because we want to make sure that the local community are 100, almost 100% 100 involved in the implementation of the project. So we select uh, a few uh, civil society groups, we empower them so that they can be able to support in the promotion and implementation of uh, inclusive education in the target areas in those four countries. So when the empowered CS groups engage the community for a mind change through our awareness creation to address the misconceptions that many people have about disability. They think that a child with disability cannot learn, is useless and all that. And also other children have been marginalized. This has been very successfully done by the CS groups. They also advocate towards the former duty bearers, the government institutions, 
to implement existing policies. In all the countries we are working in, they have wonderful policies, they are wonderful laws, but implementation is a big, big problem. So the CS groups are searching, they are reminding the, CS, the, the government about their role to distribute and also implement the, policy, uh, the policies. Because most of these countries, education has not been involved. It is still a function of the national government. That means we, the, the, the policies that are in the national government, which are not being implemented, affect a lot the implementation and even get, get, getting resources to the children down there in the rural areas especially. Now, the key actors um, of the program, they also have a well-established reflective practice as catalysts. What do I mean by that? They engage the CS groups with, for shared responsibilities, and then they are always engaging in a process of continuous learning within the inclusive educational network, within individual countries in the four countries, and also across, because they have to work with other alliances, they have to work with other stakeholders. For a successful inclusive education program to, su to succeed, we need to have alliances. We need to work with the government. We need to collaborate with all that. Having the child as our target so that the child can get quality education. And therefore, the other thing that we do is uh, to collaborate with the government. We know that in all the countries, the responsibility of education for all children, including those who are marginalized, disabled, and us, is a responsibility of the government. And therefore, our key actors, these are the CS groups, they collaborate very well with the government at that local level, because without the support of the government, you cannot go far. So they work with the parents, they work with the CS group, we work with the other NGOs, and mainly they also collaborate with the government. For the government, they remind them about their responsibilities, uh, about especially on the implementation of the policies that are already in existence and also reviewing the policies where maybe there are gaps. And we have noted that in our six years within the program, where we have got improved collaboration between the FDBs, the government institutions, and the CS groups, this one enhances a successful implementation of the program, whether it is in inclusive education or any other regular program, but our focus in inclusive education. Next slide, please. Yeah, in the course of our work, we have a, a, a lot of challenges. We have encountered a lot of challenges and maybe barriers because um, as you know, inclusion is a process and not a state. It's not something that can be able to have a timeline and say, we are going to have the end game of inclusive education at a given time. It's a continuous process of identifying and minimizing barriers which are encountered by the learners to access quality education. And therefore, in order to bring the, the needed required change, investment is needed in a broad range of measures to identify and remove the barriers which affect implementation of inclusive education and also build the framework on which it can be sustained. There are very many barriers to inclusive education, but I will only focus on the three main ones. The first one, which is the biggest uh, the biggest one, according to me. I'm also a teacher, a, a professional teacher of these children. And I know the biggest challenge is not impairment, it's not the disability that the children have, but the society's negative attitudes. When I talk about society, it's across board. The teachers, the community members, even the government officers. And what, with that negative attitude results to discrimination, stigma, Still typing of these children that they are useless, they cannot be able to learn and it's like that one. And by the end of the day, they are denied their basic right, they are denied dignity and their potential. According to me as a practicing teacher, no child, regardless of the type of disability, cannot learn. It depends on you as an individual. 
what do you interpret learning is? Because learning is not only academic learning. There's so much. This and therefore they you get the opportunity to learn like other children. So the other one is about environmental barriers. These are the basic barriers. In most of the buildings, the schools that our children are enrolled in, they have ramps, and if they don't have ramps, they have steps. And therefore, children with disabilities who are using mobility assistive devices, like crutches, like wheelchairs, they are unable to get in the classrooms. And therefore, again, we have a problem of communication. Children with communication problems, those with hearing impairment, we have inaccessible communication gadgets. And therefore, environmental barriers create disability that uh, affects participation and also inclusion. And lastly, the, the other barrier is about institutional barriers. What I mean by institutional barriers, these are the policies, the laws, and the strategies that discriminate children with disabilities, that discriminate children with learning disabilities, and also in uh, other life, those with disabilities. And therefore, and again, lack of implementation, as I said earlier on, the countries have policies, they have very good laws, yeah, but they are not implemented. So lack of these uh, policies and lack of implementation and also political goodwill affects implementation of, uh, of quality education for these children. And therefore, we need commitment as key stakeholders in this sector. We need commitment to the basic rights of every child in inclusive education. Through legal reform, we need policy and guidance, service delivery, cultural and behavior change, and also respect for human rights. And also we need to train and support teachers who are doing great work to support children in, in, with disabilities and other learning needs in inclusive settings. And also participatory agreement and engagement with the children themselves and also the families. Next slide, please. In the course of our work, we have identified we, we, uh, that uh, people who are able to be good change agents. And remember, for a, a successful inclusive education program, no one, no one individual, no, no organization can be able to start uh, to succeed alone. That means we need alliances. But in the course of alliances and collaboration, we have identified key people who can be great change agents, who can pass information about the children's rights to education and other basic rights. Top on the list are the parents and the caregivers. They are the ones who are closest to the children in their daily life. Therefore, when they are empowered, they work as strong groups and motivated change agents. And they are able to lobby and advocate for the rights of their children, including support them, supporting them in school environment. The other ones are the children themselves, the children with disabilities. Yeah? Because of the negative attitude, being labeled, being called names, they lack self-confidence on who they are and what they can do. They have potentials, but because they are told you can't be able to do this you are unable, you are disabled and all that. They lack self-confidence. And therefore, what we have noted is that when these children are empowered, they are able to be great change agents through self-advocacy, where they can carry out self-advocacy among their peers, siblings, their family, in the community, and even the government themselves. I have attended that I have seen children themselves doing self-advocacy. And you see even great ministers in the education department and other senior people changing their attitude because of seeing what the children can do through self advocacy. The other group we have seen, they are good in CJ agents, are the civil society organization. These are people who are closely working with the communities in the local areas. And through our awareness creation, they change the people's attitude. We have seen, like what Katja said in Somalia, when they started, 
uh, saying they are, they, are, they are no children with disability in this particular village. But going there for identification, they found many, many of a hundred of them. So the CS groups are the ones who are closely with the community and they are able to change their attitude. And then we have um, people with disabilities and their organization. Through their presence and expertise, they have their, their a big role as strategic partners for the implementation of inclusive education program. Remember, they always say nothing for us without us. And that means they have that uh, thing about children with disabilities must be educated. It's their basic right. And they are very good. They don't shy away from saying we, we need our children to get education like anybody else. And then we have teachers and school leadership. As a teacher myself, teachers' attitudes can be a major limitation for inclusive education. And therefore, when teachers are well trained and they are supported and they have positive attitudes, they are great change agents because they'll be able to create an inclusive environment where our children are given opportunities to learn at their own pace. In a class, normally we have three groups of children. We have the most of the average, we have below average, those with learning disabilities, and we also the, the above average, those who are gifted and talented. If a teacher has positive attitudes, he'll be able to give all these children equal opportunities so that the children can be able to learn at their own pace, on their own pace. And then finally, we have the Minister of Education. They are the custodian of, the, of, of, the, of money. They are the custodian of the policies. And therefore, if we can change their attitude, we shall have more resources given to the, to the children with disabilities and others. We shall have more teachers being trained. We shall have more assistive justice being bought. And therefore, this is another group that is very, very, very important. Next slide. Uh, in the course of our work, what have we really established? We have done a lot. The, start, the program started six years ago. Here, Katya had just said, we just finished phase two in December last year, and we are now starting phase three. But we have uh, seen a lot of good results. And one of the key things we have seen, we have established influential and vibrant, vibrant civil society groups that will continue promoting inclusive education long after the phase out of the program. Because although we have a timeline in the program, uh, 10 years, we need the whole thing to continue. We need the CS group to continue. And therefore, our, one of the objectives was to make sure that we have vibrant, empowered civil society group that can, can continue the work long after the phase out. We also have a strength and coordination of actors. Remember, as I said earlier on, nobody can achieve alone uh, anything in education. And therefore, we want partnership. We want alliances. So we have been able to enhance, to strengthen the coordination of various actors in the target area, so that at the local level, so that they can, we ensure their participation in planning, when they are planning for whatever's going to be done. Also the implementation and the monitoring of the inclusive education initiative. That's something we have seen is going to have very, very good results in the future, very great impact when many people are working together, the parents, the community, the NGOs who are there, government officers. When they are sit together at the same table and plan together, that having the child in mind, definitely we have good results. We have also trained teachers in selected schools on uh, basic IE pedagogy because a teacher uh, who is uh, in an inclusive class, he or she needs to have the basic skills, knowledge, and also attitude to be able to support all the children. So we have given uh, trained teachers on basic IE pedagogy and also functional educational assessment which give them the skills for screening and early identification of the children with learning needs. And they also carry out um, outreach services in the villages. Sometimes they go with the CS groups to the community so that 
when a child is identified, when a child is brought by the parent, they are able to, to give advice to the parent accordingly. And then our CS groups have done wonderfully well in creating awareness in the community, whereby they, they encourage the activity, they encourage change of attitude, where that, where that has resulted in increase in social awareness and also the potential of children with disabilities, the girl child, and all other children who are vulnerable to stigmatization and also marginalization. We have also established and empowered strong family support groups. When parents change their attitude, uh, they are the as I said, they are the best agent. And therefore, what we have done in all these areas we are working in, we have established and empowered parents of children with disabilities to be working together, meeting together, and sharing challenges, experiences, and how to support their children. And alongside that, we have also established in the schools we are working in, we have established children clubs where they also do self-advocacy. Children uh, clubs or children with disabilities and without disabilities, and also the girl clubs. This one, they are doing wonderfully well in creating awareness among the other children in the school and all that. And then we have also established model schools. As I said earlier, one of the biggest problem is a physical barrier. So we have identified a few schools in every target area where we have renovated to make them accessible with the aim of the local government or the government replicating the same. So we have several schools that we, where that uh, have child disability, child and disability and gender sensitive learning environments where we have constructed the ramps, disability friendly toilets and also other things. And we are, I, I'm happy to report that Tanzania, one of the countries, we have seen the government replicating about more than 40 schools being replicated by the government. They have seen the model. How does an, uh, an accessible school looks like? Uh, having rams and all that, which is a very big, big impact. And we hope that even more and more schools will be replicated. And lastly, we have uh, promoted advocacy to us, the, um, the uh, former duty bearers at the grassroots level, whereby I said earlier alone, we have reviewed the existing policy advocacy uh, strategies about the policies. And uh, we have also identified through the CS group any gaps that need to be uh, looked up, whether that need to be worked on by the government, especially some of the policies that were done long time ago, maybe they have gaps, things are changing, in inclusive education is dynamic. And therefore we use the CS group and the other IE network within the local areas to identify the gaps, which then they are supposed now to be escalated to the national level for consideration and probably implementation by the national government policymakers, whereby we require more resources. Thank you very much. Back to Kacha to conclude. Thank you very much, Stephen, um, for this. I will just uh, close this by also sharing a, so a few learnings from, from the years. So as Stephen mentioned, we, we have been working regionally in four different countries, but what we also so we had done good. We have local influence on uh, local governments, but and now taking uh, the program to national level, we found that uh, it's difficult for our local groups uh, to gain national influence. Uh, one of the things is, of course, distance. Uh, it's also education. Um, they are busy with many other things, uh, and and to go to members of parliament, to ministries, national ministries, is is a challenge, as it would be in my own country, Denmark, for for me to access uh, and get influence as as a, if from a local group. So we found there's a gap. We want to have national influence, but there's a gap. So so now we are working in different ways with a subgroup to educational alliances with different working groups to to push our push our agenda with inclusive education. One of the things we also realized is that we actually in between sectors. Uh, we are of course working with education, but we are also representing uh, 
the disability movement somehow, but as a faith-based organization. <laughs> so we are working closely with the disability movement, but we're trying to push influence in the educational sector, as well as also needing support from the health uh, sector. So, so that is a challenge, and, and because educational sector and educational alliance has many agendas, not just inclusion. Uh, so what we found to be a good um, way of still working with it is to, of course, get strategic partners. And for many times we think of strategic partners as we need to find somebody who are equal to us, who burn for this and has such a great passion like us. But often uh, these are not there, or if they are, they are few. So we have identified different partners. Some are short-term friends that we can do a campaign with, and some are long-term friends, like the disability organizations. They are long-term friends because they, they are the true voice of people with disabilities. But also, of course, being a faith-based organization, we also uh, try to use our national partners in the countries or other religious actors to be a push because we can of course go with the alliances and but also we need push from from other influential voices in society and here uh, we have found that our national network for instance in tanzania has been quite effective. Um, so uh, yeah so we value different partners uh, even though they are short term or long term and of course, we've also realized that uh, we need evidence, uh, better evidence of we produced the last couple of years. And we also need uh, cooperations with uh, leading uh, institution and researchers to help us provide uh, the evidence uh, that is needed. And um, yeah, I want to also um, yeah, conclude with the, the, just a reflection, because sometimes when we want to go and have influence in advocacy and lobbying, we, we come with our own evidence and we think this will convince, but also, often it, I think it's also good to ask the people in power that has sympathy with our agenda, what kind of evidence do you want? What kind of evidence do you actually need to convince your colleagues? Uh, because sometimes we can do something that is not of value for them. Um, so that is just a, a reflection to leave. And then also ending with uh, the main barrier that I think uh, is maybe also needed uh, in the in the challenge with um, keeping children close to their families, it is the negative ad, not the negative attitude, but the mental um, what do you say the cultural challenge. So the whole awareness of of the child's uh, best is a uh, is a great uh, challenge for edu inclusive education, but also I think for this agenda to to grow. Um, so thank you for your and apologies for our speaking for a long time, <laughs> but thank you for listening. <laughs>